got a question for you, and I need to know how many people here you love being last. Anybody? <laughs> you thought I was going to say first, didn't you? All right. How many love being last? I didn't think so. Right, yeah, exactly. Okay, well, maybe not last, but how many enjoy You love it when you're second place. Anybody? I mean, you love it so much. All right. So anybody here run a marathon, half a marathon, 5K, 10K, and you're in the lead, and, you, and you're running to the finish line, and you stop just before you cross the finish line, and you wait for the second person behind you because you're in first place. You wait for them to pass you so they get first because you want to get second. Anybody, anybody here like that? Yeah, didn't think so. Why is that? Well, because obviously we all want to be first. We want to win. We want to be the best. I mean, being the greatest is important, I mean, to all of us. I remember so many times, you have these memories too, right? You get, you pull up to the mall, you got a car full of kids, they run out of the, out of the car, they head to the mall, and they yell, I got to the doors first. I mean, anybody else, right? I have a brother, we're, we're, we're 18 months apart. I remember as kids, there'd be a little bit of juice left in the fridge, and so we'd take our cups out, and I would pour it out, and I would measure just to make sure he didn't get more than me. I didn't care if I got more of him, but there's no way he's getting more than me. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? I remember fishing one time with a group of men, and there was just this thing that we didn't even plan it, but all of a sudden, guys are like, I caught the biggest fish. I caught the biggest fish. I mean, have you ever been around, like, teenagers where, like, no, you eat six pieces of pizza, I can down a whole box, or I could drink a whole case of pop. I mean, we just have this thing. I ate the most. I caught the biggest fish. I was at a restaurant a while ago, and someone is boasting about how much they ate. I mean, I ate the most. And we, we, it's just, what is it with this need to be first, to be the best, to be the greatest, to be the smartest, to be the most spiritual? It's everywhere. Help me out with this. I mean... Let me, Martin Luther King was known as a very, he's considered great. He was known as a great individual. Mother Teresa was known uh, as, as a great individual who helped poor, helped the poor. I mean, there's so many people. Wayne Gretzky is known as the great one. You already know. See, see we, we just know people through their greatness. Some say that Elvis Presley was the greatest singer of all time. I was just getting my breath. It wasn't an intentional pause. <laughs> Babe Ruth. I mean, some say he might have been the greatest baseball player of all time, right? What about Alexander the... You already... See, that's what I'm talking about. We're known for our greatness. We're not known for coming second or last. Everyone wants to be first and not last. And, and things haven't changed a whole lot. It, it, it was the same thing when Jesus picked a group of individuals who were, for the most part, uneducated. They weren't the greatest in the community. They weren't known for all their abilities. They were just simple guys, and Jesus picked them to be on his team. But even they struggled with this greatness thing. An argument even breaks out. Mark chapter 9 talks a little bit about it, but, but they're on the, the road to Capernaum, and, and, and they get into an argument. Can you imagine disciples? They get into an argument. And I wasn't there, and the Bible doesn't record what they said, but maybe it was something like, guys, Jesus picked us to be his disciples, but I don't feel that great. I don't feel like I've accomplished a whole lot. Man, when we get to heaven, I, I think the Pharisees, man, they're going to be the greatest in, in the heaven because they, they just, they, they, just I, they know so much. They, they're just so good at following all the rules. They, they obey everything right to the T. They dot the I. Dot, you know, they just... They, and then, and then maybe John speaks up and says, Oh, I'm Peter. I don't know about that. The scribes, they could quote scripture like nobody. I mean, they, they were just so intelligent. Maybe they'll be the greatest in, in heaven. And then maybe Matthew says, Guys, I don't know, but I think it's going to be the Sadducees. They, I mean, they had theology. They just knew everything about everything. And then maybe Luke pops up and says, Guys, you got it all wrong. Like, think, we are the ones. Jesus picked us, and we gave everything up. We gave it all up to follow Jesus. Don't you think that counts for something? I mean, maybe it's not those guys that are going to be the greatest. Maybe it's one of us, the disciples. Maybe we'll be the greatest. And if we're the greatest, one of the disciples possibly says, well, it's probably me. I've given the most up. And then one of the other disciples says, what are you talking about? You gave the most up. I gave the most up. I'll be the greatest. And then they get into an argument. 
Where's my clicker at? Where did that disappear? Is that back on the booth there somewhere? Thank you, Jared. And so I want you to see this. They get into a fight. The Bible says at that time the disciples came to Jesus and they ask, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is it? Like, Lord, we, we're we not sure how this all works. Like, who's it going to be? And as the accountant Mark says, they're on their way to Capernaum and our argument breaks out. And Jesus, in a way, almost like embarrasses them. He, he's like, guys, you got it all wrong. Like, what are you talking about? Who's going to be the greatest? How you define greatness is different than how I define greatness, Jesus says. I mean, that's what he's implying here. It's not like what constitutes greatness anyway. Think about it for a moment. In our world, to be great, you got to be a somebody. you got to be the best of the best. you got to achieve something. And, and not only do you need to achieve something, but other people need to know that you're the best of the best so that they can see you as great. I mean, you need attention to be known as great. You need some sort of to be noticed by other people. See how? But, but I guess the question for us today, how, to, how is it in God's eyes? What does greatness look like to him? Well, the disciples were asking Jesus that very question. And so Jesus, Jesus says this. There's a bunch of people around. The disciples are there. And Jesus says, okay, you want to know what greatness is? Hmm. Can you come here, Josiah, for a quick sec? Really fast, for two seconds. Come right up here. I'll hear it when I get home. All right. Jesus, in front of all the adults, he calls a little child and he says, Hey, you want to know what greatness is? And then he starts talking about children. All right, bud, go back and have a seat. He starts talking about children. I'm sure people were looking at Jesus confused, like, what are you talking about to be the greatest? You? And Jesus says, well, if you want to be great, he called the child, the little child to him and placed the child amongst them. They got to understand children at that time in that culture, and, and maybe it's the same now in some ways, there was a lot riding on kids, but it doesn't seem to be now like it was then. I mean, Kids really served a purpose, and that was to benefit the family. They weren't just kids were, were, were you know, just happened to, to show up so that, you know, it, it, could, it, it would be all about them. No, no, the kids were expected to carry on the family name. They were, they were born, they were conceived so that they would carry on the father's business, or, they, or, or you know, they would be raised as sons or daughters, and, and, you know, to take on the family business, or to do the chores of the house, or help out in the fields, I mean... There was a purpose to these kids. But other than, you know, looking toward the future as children, they didn't really, they were powerless. They, there was nothing important about them. They were there to benefit the family. And as they grew, it was only until they got older and they grew in stature that they were given placement as, you know, given rights as members in the community. But as kids, they were just seen as that. Kids, almost like, you know what, one day there will be a purpose for you. Right now there's no purpose, but one day you're going to take over your father's trade. One day you're going to help your mom. Like, that was their purpose. And so Jesus says, in front of all these people, they're like, what does it mean to be the greatest? And Jesus takes a little child up and he says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like these little children, you know the children that were just up on the stage dancing around? He's like, unless you change and become like little children, you don't have to worry about being the greatest in heaven. He's like, you're not even going to make it there. You're not getting there unless you become like these little children. And I'm thinking, you're kidding me, right? Are you serious? Anybody else, when you were a kid, you were always told, would you grow up? Anybody else besides me? I say it to my kids all the time. When they act immature or they're fighting, I say, listen, act your age. Anybody else have that said to you? I always say, grow up. And then I read this, and Jesus is saying, grow down. He's like, you want to be the greatest? Be like these children. I always thought I had to grow up, but he's saying, no, no, don't grow up. Now, I watched the show, I don't know how many years ago, a long time ago. I don't even know if it's still a show, but they were doing these weird things. Because TV's not weird, right? But they were, you, yeah, you know what it is. 
Um, I mean, they were showing people living lifestyles that were just like, you scratch your head and like, what are you thinking? And one of them was about a guy who would go to work during the day and come home and he wanted to be a child. He wanted to be a baby. And so his wife, she would change him from his work clothes into a diaper and she would cuddle him and she would, you know, just treat him like a kid. They even built this huge crib for him to sleep in. I mean, you're watching this shaking your head like, this can't be real. And they're like, this is real. This is what some people are doing. That's not what Jesus was talking about when he said, grow down. <laughs> That's not what he was getting at. The Bible actually says to leave childish ways, get off the milk and on to meat as you mature and grow in your faith with Jesus. But then Jesus comes along and says, unless you change and become like children, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. change if there's one thing that god requires of all of us is change change have you ever met the person who it's always somebody else's fault have you ever met the person who just time and time and time again nothing goes right for them and it's almost like well it's because of this because of that like and it, it would do us all good maybe some days just to take a mirror up to our own individual faces and just say, God, what do I need to change? Am I the root of the problem? Am I the reason why this is happening? Jesus says, unless we change and become like little children, we're not getting in. Many of us resist change, but Jesus says we need to change. You and I need to change. I need to change. You need to change to be more like God. The reason why we need to change is because we need to become less like ourselves and more like Jesus. And I'm not talking about outward change. How many of us, I mean, in our society, everything is about outward appearances, isn't it? You have to look a certain way, drive a certain vehicle, have, make certain income. You have to have an image. You have to do yourself up. You have to look a certain way. You do your hair and, you know, you know makeup and, you, you know, go to the gym, work out, get lots of muscles. Like, it's all about outward appearances. But the kind of Jesus, change Jesus is talking about is this, is inward. And I bet you many of us wouldn't really focus so much on our outward change if we worked more on inward change. It's just the way it is. When was the last time you saw a kid care about what their hair looked like? I'm not promoting go out and, you know, look terrible, but some of the things we get hung up on kids, they just don't care. It doesn't matter if their shirt doesn't match their pants. It doesn't matter if their shoes are a little older than their friends. I mean, kids, Jesus says the greatest, you need to change. Kids weren't the greatest. When Jesus spoke this, they didn't have all the answers. They didn't even know what they were going to be doing with the rest of their life because they didn't even care about tomorrow. They were just enjoying the day. Jesus says, unless you change, you'll be like little kids. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Matter of fact, kids, they did not know what they were doing at all because they were so dependent on their parents. They didn't eat unless their parents fed them. Everything, they were just dependent on their parents. And Jesus was saying, listen, disciples, you need to be less dependent on yourself and more dependent on Jesus. Be like little kids. They need their parents. And Jesus was saying, guys, girls, you need your father. You need him. You need Jesus. And so Jesus went on. I'll finish with this verse here. Therefore, whoever takes this lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom. You want to know what the greatest in the kingdom is? Who the greatest in the kingdom is? He's like, whoever takes on a lowly position like this child. If you want to see a picture of humility, look at a child's life. I mean, a child's life, you know what their number one responsibility is? It's to obey their parents. That's their responsibility. The responsibility isn't to worry about, you know, at five years old, what they're going to do with the rest of their life. The responsibility isn't to go out and make money for their family. The responsibility isn't to do it. Their responsibility is to obey their parents. Is to trust their parents. Do you ever notice that kids are way better at, uh, at the faith thing than us adults are? 
Anybody else ever notice that? Because humility and obedience go hand in hand, right? I love, I remember times, um, um, you know, just, just talking to our kids, you know, we try to make supper a, a meaningful time. We try to have supper together. We don't do supper where, oh, where's, where's so-and-so? He's up in his room on, on the, the, the game system. Or where's the other one? Oh, he's downstairs. Like, we try to make supper a point where we gather, we sit together, and we just talk. Yeah, sure, there's fighting. Sure, there's arguing. Sure, I mean, but we try to make a time in our days where we're together and we're building relationship. It's so important. So important. I remember time to telling our kids, you know, they don't always like what they get to eat. Some days it could be craft dinner. Some days it could be meat and potatoes. It just, that's not the point. The point is, like, I know enough to know that my kids trust me enough to, for me to say, listen, if you eat your broccoli, you're going to be strong like your dad. It doesn't work anymore when they get older, but when they're younger, I remember moments where I would say, listen, eat your supper. I know you don't like it, but if you eat it, you're going to get muscles. And it's all, they look at you like, really? And then a few minutes later, you'll just walk by the washroom, and then they're in their posing to see if, you know, it actually worked because they believe everything their father tells them. And Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand, listen, guys, you need to trust your father. You need to be like these little children. You need to have faith. You need to take a low position. Because I don't know about you, but there's a big push on in life to be the best of the best, the first, the smartest, the greatest, the prettiest, most handsome. And Jesus is like, uh -uh. He's like, whoever takes on a position of humility... Whoever puts others first, whoever's like these little children, they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually says, a few verses, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. And then Jesus says this in in uh, Luke chapter 22, but you are not to be like that. You're not to go after, you know, to be the best of the best. He's like, instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But Jesus says, I'm among you as one who serves. Jesus is like, I've taken the lowly position. And so, as we wrap up, our day camp finale and head over in just a few moments for some food. Let's not all race over there to see who's going to be first. <laughs> Ever think, you know, some of the reasons why there's so much conflict and struggle in our world is because at the root of it, there's a des desire to be the greatest. You ever realize, like, why, there, why is there so much war in the world? It's just this, there's this desire to be the best, to win, to be the greatest. I mean, at every argument you have with your spouse, the desire is to win. You don't go into an argument trying to lose. I mean, what is it, right? We want to be in control. We want to win. We want to be right. And yet Jesus says, no, no, the greatest is when you take on a position of humility and obedience. And so the next time you look at your child and go, wow, I wish they would grow up. Maybe go to the mirror and say, I need to grow down. I need to be like a child. And so I'm going to invite you to stand with us today as we conclude our time together. But I want to want to just say this, whether you're in this room now or whether you're watching online, I don't know where you are in your journey with Jesus. Maybe there's somebody here today or watching that has never started one. Maybe you've been so preoccupied by the standards of the world that you've forgotten that it's not about being top. It's not about stepping on someone to get above. It's not about being the best of the best. It's actually about being a follower of Jesus. That's what counts. And I mean, that was our whole purpose for this day camp. Yeah, we wanted to excite the kids. We wanted to bless them. But we also wanted to help people learn about Jesus. 
It's so important. It's so valuable. That's the reason why we exist as a church. I'm not sure if you are aware of that. We're here for a purpose. If, if the only purpose for us to exist was to be saved and you gave your life to Jesus, he would have taken us all to heaven by now. But he saved us to send us to help people discover him. To take the good news that we've been given and to share it with people who don't have it yet. And I don't know where you are in this place, but maybe you're like, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about Christianity. But whatever you're saying, if it's true, I'd like to be a part of that. I, I'd, I'd like to know Jesus. If, if, if he takes the pressure off of me of trying to look the best to be the best, and, and that's not his definition of greatness. If Jesus' definition of greatness is I just have to be who he's created me to be, wow, that sounds a lot easier than trying to be somebody I'm not created to be. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I, I, I want to I give Jesus a try. I want to open my heart to him. Then I, I'm just going to invite you as we pray just to have have a conversation with God. And it's very simple. You just, all you have to do is just, just do that. It's like, God, I don't know what's happened with my life. I, I, I've done some things I'm not proud of. Or, or maybe, maybe you're just like, I, I don't even know much about Christianity, but, but I know something's got to change. I can't keep going the way I've been going. There's, there's, I mean, I'm trying to get ahead, but there's something missing in my life. Did you know that something missing is, is Jesus? Because every single one of us in this place, watching online, that drives by our streets, that we see in our schools, our workplaces, every single person that walks the face of this earth have been created with a void that can only be filled with a relationship with Jesus. And that's why if it's not filled with Jesus, you're going to go to one thing to the next thing to try to fill that thing that was missing. So I want to tell you that Jesus fills the void. And he helps us live a life that we're supposed to live. And so as we pray today and conclude our, our morning, I, I just invite you to have a conversation with Jesus. Maybe you're like, I, I really don't know what to say. Just, just be yourself. If you were to come up to me after and say, hey, listen, I, I just, this is, this, is, this is what I'm struggling with, or this is who I am and I need... You, you don't have to come to a pastor, a priest, to get to God. You can have a conversation with him right now. He's that accessible. And so if you're not sure what to pray, just, just, just pray something similar like, God, forgive me. Give me all the stuff that I've done. My life is not working out. I need you. And I accept your son Jesus into my life. And I'm sorry for the things I've done. I, I, want, I want my life to change and I want to put you first. Just something like that. Giving him permission to change you. Because he said, unless we change and be like little children, we're not getting in. And so join your hearts with me as we pray. And maybe you need to have a little conversation with him yourself. Father, thank you for what a fantastic week. God, we have done our best to make it about you. We pray that kids that aren't even in this place today are changed because of it. Lord, for those who might be in this place today that they're recognizing that, yes, change does need to happen in their lives. I pray for them, Lord. That person or those individuals, whoever they are, you know. I pray, Lord, that today would be the day of a new beginning a changed life. And I thank you for what you're doing in hearts because we know your word doesn't return void. Lord, you're changing lives even right now in this space. You're changing lives, Lord, for those who are watching online. That's just what you do. That's who you are. The life giver. The one who loves us more than we'll ever know. The one who gives solutions to our problems. The one who forgives us of our sins. The one whose kindness leads us to repentance. You're that one, Father. Jesus, we thank you. And as we leave this place today, I pray for all of us, every single one, whether we've been on this journey for 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50, or one month. 
Father, that we would walk closer to you, that we would be who you called us to be. I pray you would bless our, our food as we eat in just a few moments, Lord. We pray for maybe vehicles driving by would turn our cars around and come on and, and have some food together. Lord, that we would get opportunity to share you with them. Lord, we're here for you. You've given us a mandate, a mission to make disciples of all nations. And it starts with each one of us in this room. Father, we pray your spirit would lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus strong.